check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. All right, I'm here today with uh, Coach Mark Walters, uh, head coach at Lincoln Memorial University Men's and Women's, uh, the Rail Splitters. How are you doing today, Coach? Alec, good to have you. I appreciate you asking me to get out of bed before 11 o'clock. It's a great day. Yeah, so it only took me asking Coach about five or so times uh, to finally get him on the show. And don't let him fool you. I think he's more excited than he leads on. And uh, we got some really great topics to talk about today. Um, you know, my own introduction of Coach, uh, I've known him for probably, I don't know, probably the last seven or eight years, right before I started college. Um, he was the head coach at West Virginia Wesleyan. I actually knew whenever he was the head coach at West Virginia University. Uh, he's been kind of a little bit of everywhere. Uh, he's had success at every stop. And uh, part of the reason why I'm so excited to have him. Uh, coach, why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of your background, uh, both as a player and then as a coach? Well, you, got, you might have to hope you have some stuff written down in front of you because it's, I'm at the age now where trying to remember what I did last week is, is pretty tough. Um, <laughs> well, we know I, you played at Fairmont. I did. And before that, I, I was a, I was a uh, high school player at Morgantown High. I didn't pick up uh, tennis until I got to high school because I thought I was a baseball player. Um, I, it turns out, you know, you have to be able to catch, throw, and run to be a baseball player. And uh, once you hit the ball, if you can't get out of the box, you know, on a line drive to, to left field, if you're getting thrown out first, you're probably not going to make the team. So uh, the day I got cut, I was walking out the door, and the high school tennis coach was a guy named Joe Hill. And uh, if anybody out there knows where Joe Hill is, I'd love to catch up with him. But he, uh, he was waiting for me to get cut. He knew right away. He's like, Walters, you've got nothing else going on. You've got, I know you don't study, so I know you have plenty of time to do so. Uh, he thought I had some hand-eye coordination, and he felt like I wanted to be good at something. So he's like, you're going to try tennis. Now, my parents had played a little bit. And I think he knew that they played. So I think maybe he just thought by osmosis I would be able to pick it up. But I learned a lot about developing people that have never played. Joe's, Joe's way of teaching us was very mechanical, very simplistic, and um, it, it, it led to great success. And the days of a high school coach actually working with players, developing the talent, and spending the time in, he was, he was like a true college coach in high school. Uh, not to mention he was a math genius, so no, I wish he'd taught me more of that. So I got to uh, I got done with Morgantown High. We were on a fairly good team back then. Uh, we went with four guys to state in that format and finished second in the state behind a pretty good Parkersburg team at the time. Uh, beat GW. Uh, I lost to my guy in the finals at two, but uh, um, you know, the, just as far as the team goes, that it was as far as a Morgantown team had ever gotten until uh, Terry threw that bunch out there uh, in the 90s with John Carty and uh, Ika and uh, Ashok Agrawal and uh, Ashok Raju, those guys were, that's nuts. To have four guys division one level uh, and then the Martinelli boy, um, stupid good team. So uh, the team I was on, not, not stupid good, just stupid. So we went, I went to, uh, I went to Fairmont on a visit and talked to Craig White. And Craig White. Greg White, he of the Dumb and Dumber Bowl haircut. I love, I love Craig White. Uh, he, he was super nice to me. He offered me $1,000. Back then, $1,000 was probably 80% of his budget, okay? And at that time, I would have been the two or three player on his team. He knew that, right? He knew that I'd be two or three. But he, he, <laughs> he brought in two high school All-Americans in Eddie Sizemore, and Greg Whitmore, and B.J. LaHosset came the next year. Um, Dan Lonegro, this hunter, fisherman, crazy dude, came from out of uh, Pennsylvania, woods. He just jumped out of the woods and uh, chased from camouflage into gym shorts and started playing tennis. Uh, amazing athlete. His brothers were all professional base basketball and uh, baseball players. And uh, we had a guy from out of Pennsylvania, Beaver Falls, named Paul Cooper, who could smoke a half a pack on the changeovers and you know, hit heavy top spin, a real good competitor. I love Paul Cooper. If he, if I missed an overhead, he would, or if he missed an overhead, he would turn around and yell at me. So, you know, no one's paying attention. They don't all look at me when they see the ball bouncing behind the court, like, you know, Walters must have missed that. So they're a very good competitor, but the team came together very quickly. I didn't go my first year. I decided I was too good for Fairmont and I went to West Virginia. I was going to walk on 
Terry said I could hang around the team and play with them in the fall because he only had five guys. I didn't realize how important six guys was. So um, Terry let me hang around for a semester until he figured out that I was more into partying, uh, not going to class. Uh, my advice for any recruit that's looking at this, don't go to college in your hometown. It is, you've already done everything in your freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year than, than socially than all those kids coming in that are there. And it's just old hat to you. So, uh, you know, when you're going to go to college, you got to be prepared to sleep, eat, tennis, and study. because That's all there is. So anyway, I failed out basically, was ineligible for the second semester. I wouldn't, I was going to be number 14 anyway, because he brought in a five, every guy he brought in, hell, the, the girlfriends of the boys he brought in were better than me. So I ended up going back to Fairmont the next year with my tail between my legs, asked Whitey if I could come out to the team, asked him if he had any money left. He was like, that ship sailed, buddy. So he, he, he made me, I had to make a three, five and I had to come to all the practices and help him with practice. And he would let me back on the team the next year. So that's what I did. So whenever one of my kids comes in and tells me, Hey coach, I'm failing this, or I got a D in this class or my GPA. So I, I know what they're doing or, or what they're not doing. You know, you can't BS a BS. -er. So uh, that's one of the great things about being a failure is that your kids can't get anything by you because you've been there, done that. Uh, um, I'm, I am the dumbest guy on my teams. Every kid I bring in is a 1200 SAT level kid. They all want to be doctors and lawyers and engineers. And um, when we have team practice, I, it's a Mensa group next to me. I'm the, I'm the waiter at the Mensa club. So uh, anyway, from there, uh, we had a really nice little team that won a couple of conference championships and uh, the guys were really good and the work ethic was good for that level of tennis in that time. But that was all I knew was that level. I had been around Terry's guys and watched them play. And later on, we can talk about all the things that I picked up from that, uh, just hanging around. Um, but you, you talk about role modeling and leading by example. I learned so much just being around there. Um, everything from how to you know, feed a ball to what to look for in recruiting and what a practice should look like and what, what true work ethic should be. But more than anything, those guys, they, they competed so hard against each other, but they really cared about each other. And you could tell that. I didn't really know at the time, but now that I've got teams, I can see what they had and understand that that's what I'm trying to, trying to build. So anyway, that's, that was my playing career. I was the number six and seven player on a very average team that had a lot of fun and uh, our guys loved each other. And, uh, you know, we had some good players on the team. Eddie Sizemore was a wonderful player. So, you know, you finished at Fairmont. Um, how did you get into coaching? I mean, did you know that, like, when you were at Fairmont State that you wanted to be a college coach? Or, you know, how did that kind of come to be in your mind, and how did it come into fruition? Well, I was really looking for some job where I could work um, outside and not have to do any real work. So when I got out of college, um, I thought I wanted to be a psychologist. And psychology goes a long way in coaching. You know that. It's 99% psychology, 1% bus driver. And, and uh, you know, the coaching is very small. So um, I got a psych degree and started to work on my master's. And in the meantime, West Virginia is the only state in the union, go figure, that you can work in psychology without a master's degree. As long as you're under the guide of a, a licensed psychologist, you could actually go out and do field work testing, counseling. Um, so I got a job in, of all places, the prison system in West Virginia and the youth, uh, youth counseling services in Elkins. And I worked two and a half, three years in the prison system. So about midway through that, the one thing about working in psychology is, Alex, you think our players are psychotic. You, you go and talk to these people that are locked up or that have such broken families and history of addiction and I mean, true, you know, people problems. It just sucks the life out of somebody like me. I'm a very empathetic person. You know, if my players are having a problem, there's something going on, they know I'm sincere about helping them. But you can't fix these situations. You don't cure anybody. It's just a, a treadmill of, of despair. So midway through that, I went home for Thanksgiving and my dad looked at me and he goes, man, you're not very happy. And I was like, what do you mean? And I feel, feel happy. And he goes, well, why don't you look back at getting into tennis? 
and because he's a uh, he's literally a rocket scientist he's an aerospace engineer he uh for him to tell me that it was okay not to be a professional at something and be a doctor and, and uh, on something with a little less educational side to it, uh, that was when I decided, hey, maybe this is good for me. And I started to look for graduate assistantships and finally found one at WVU. And, um, I was in the education department working at PE, but I had such a lot of time on my hands. So part of that time, I hung around Terry's team and uh, did whatever he asked me to do. Uh, teaching camps, clinics, if you let me help with the team. Um, I did that and you know, I just got to know all the guys, but uh, on the side, I was also in a, grad, uh, a garage band in the evening. So um, graduate school, it's the best four years of your life. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of how I got into coaching, kind of backslid into it. And then after four years of being around that team, I started to look for jobs. And uh, that's when I found the, the Nebraska Kearney job when I was graduating. So, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about this off the air, but, you know, what kind of uh, landscape was Nebraska Kearney at the time that you picked them up? Kind of what was their situation? Um, was that an NAIA school at the time, by the way, or was it D2? Uh, we had trans – they had gone to Division Two four years before I got there. And okay. So, you know, they were transitioning into D2. What was the situation when you got there? You know, when you got there and you kind of looked around, what did you see and what were you trying to change about it? Okay, my, my first impression, I remember calling my dad on September 21st of my first fall because uh, it started to snow. And we were at practice, it was, it was 60 degrees maybe, we were practicing, and by the end of practice, it was sleeting and snowing. And in like two hours, this happened. And uh, it's funny that you use the word landscape because you could stand on your roof in, in Kearney and see everybody in town. I mean, it was so flat. Flat and, you know, beautiful, beautiful country, and I got very used to it. Um, the one thing about out there, sunsets and, and sunrises are amazing. So uh, great, great people. Uh, again, I, I got so lucky because uh, when I got there, the people are very similar to West Virginia. Um, i am always been a guy that I like to just help people. And I'm a, a pleaser, I guess. I want If you've got a, a project you want to do, I want to help you do it or finish it for you. And I want to make sure that it gets done and you're happy. I might ask you 50 times, hey, is, that, is this what you want? Is this good? You know, I'm not really fishing for compliments as much as I just want to hear, yeah, I'm happy with that. And, uh, you know, that, that's just the way I operate. So when I went out there, they were so nice to me, but they were also fearful that I was a conda come in for a year or two carpetbagger who would be, you know, very selfish and then not build anything, but just take and leave. And, um, they were, they wouldn't let, they had a four court indoor building that was basically a barn and they used it from Monday through Thursday for a tennis club where we put nets up and the roof was maybe 28, 30 feet high. And the lights were just these big balls that blind you if you looked up into them. The courts were that really fast concrete that was just painted. So yeah, yeah. it was like playing on a gym floor. My teams were 56 and three in that building over four and a half years. Home court advantage. Our only losses were to number one, Central Oklahoma, number nine, Northwest Missouri State, five, four, and Southern Colorado in my first year, seven, two. Those were my only three losses. And then we, the, we, but the other thing was teams would come, they'd come to that school while we were no, no good. By the third year, when we got good, we started beating those teams. Nobody would come back because it wasn't really a fair setup. And uh, again, uh, we could talk about that later, but it's really important that you treat people fairly when they, when they come to your place. I was more about winning matches, I think, at that time. And, um, but, but the beauty of it was I had indoor tennis. So back then, Alex, or Alec, the, uh, the region was Minnesota, Michigan to Texas, Colorado over to Indiana. And there were 112 teams in the region. 12 of those teams made the NCAA regional. They would have three different regionals of four teams. So uh, it was a really different setup with four regions nationally. And to get into that club, it was very difficult. Um, I had six players from Nebraska high school tennis and one Jamaican kid who never showed up on time. That was my, that was the first team that I had. So, uh, you know, it was a, it was really a tough deal. Now I was, I was hell bent for recruiting uh, American kids. I wanted to be that guy who I want to get American kids in. And my my first recruiting class, I had 
seven boys that were all better than the guys that were on my team currently. And then I had uh, maybe four or five girls. Our team GPA was barely above a 3.0. Our team work ethic and partying was horrible. I had all kinds of off-court problems. And um, my dealing with parents wasn't the best because there was a lot of chaos. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to lead anybody. The kids were running all over me. I was trying not to upset. And I, I was trying to run a junior program in the indoor building. So it was just a cluster of, you know, of inexperience. So my third year, I, I, I lucked out. I brought in five international guys, one from Singapore, uh, two kids from Canada, one from South Africa, and another boy from Russia. And they were all three of that. Oh, and a Polish kid, uh, Rafael Szynowski. He'll kill me if I don't mention him because he's a, he's a high-level coach in Poland now. Of that team, five of the seven are professional coaches. They, they love teaching tennis. And that team, I learned so much from them. They taught me what makes a good coach. I, had, I don't know what I learned. they learned from me. I have no idea. Maybe, maybe how to drive. That was it. Uh, the rest of the time, it was watching them stick together as a group, understanding that they were, because they were amazing students, and their work ethic was so good on, on and off court that that's what you're missing with these, some of these kids that don't have a focus. They also showed me that one person who doesn't have the same drive as everybody else can really damage everything that's going on. Sometimes the best addition is subtraction. You take somebody out, no matter how good that racket is, it makes everybody else stronger. So I learned a lot of, of valuable lessons, but the most important was recruit academics. I recruited those kids because they got great big academic scholarships and I could make my little 0.8 scholarships go a long way and um, compete. We went from nowhere to number 13 in the region. Remember I told you 12 teams make it? We made it to 13 and we had two wins over teams in the top from 10 and 11 and 12. But those were some very high profile programs that weren't going to let us into the club at first. So, uh, you know, we got, we got ranked, which was, you know, woo good for you. But they weren't going to let us into the tournament until we proved ourselves. There was a couple other reasons they wouldn't let us in either, which um, we can talk about later. It goes, it goes with basically culture and um, how you behave on the court. We weren't, we weren't ready. So, you know, you, by your year, you say maybe by year three, you, you've got in some new guys. You said they were international players. Um, you say that the culture started to swing specifically. You talked about the grade point average started becoming better. Uh, the team camaraderie started to become closer. And how much do you think that really ties into winning? Because I think that's something that's overlooked is really the off-court stuff. Because I think a lot of people think talent wins championships. And I've seen a lot of talent never win a championship. And that comes in all sports. But just how much do you think that that affected and impacted your, your team camaraderie and your ability to win on the court? We were, we were 14 and 7 the first year with the men, and we were 7 and 9 with the women's team. I kid you not, the girls' team, their biggest accomplishment was at the beginning of the year, we couldn't warm up with two balls and doubles. They had to only have one ball on the court to hit. And we won seven matches. So that tells you that – with girls' tennis, women's tennis, you can really have one or two players, and if you have the right schedule, you can ha have some wins. But what you, my first weekend with them, I took those girls out to Southern Colorado, or to, or to Air Force, rather, and we played Air Force, USC, uh, Southern Colorado, which was a top 20 team, Western New Mexico, top 20 team, um, Northwest Missouri State was there. We didn't play them, but they were there. And uh, we had two other matches. We didn't win. We won one set. One of the one of the teams pulled all their players, and they played like their number six manager. And we won a set against that person. That was our every single girl on my team cried that weekend. That was their. That was my first college weekend of coaching. Drive seven hours to Air Force and win nothing, and just get destroyed. One of my girls played a lefty from USC. She hit a topspin serve. It bounced over my girl's head. She couldn't return. It like bounced the wrong way, lefty. Twice happened the first two times went over her head, and my Thanks girl just laughed. Nice. She was wonderful. She just laughed about it. But um, you know, coach, what do I do? And I'm like, what do you mean? I don't know. I can't, <laughs> I can't hit that return either. So anyway, that that was a, the low of the low. How to start off with? But you know, over time we got better, and we had a few results against some teams, and 
you know, the girls, but they came to practice every day and worked so hard. I mean, I, I used so much energy up in practices because I didn't know any better. I didn't know. I just, you know, I was crazy man out there. Um, on the guy side, we, we, we won 14 matches just by playing 14 really bad teams. And then every Division II team that we played, we got beat 7-0, basically. We maybe won a match here or there if I, you know, got a charity lineup from the other team. But um, I remember going to Northwest Missouri State, and Mark Rosewall has been there forever. Uh, he's a legend, and he's had some great teams, national championship level teams. Well, we're playing them, and I had a guy, Marcus something or other, uh, at number five from Columbus, Nebraska. Marcus Wall. He was, at, he was at number five. Marcus Wall, who is a wall. And he got into a third set. And I'm sitting on the side of the court watching this. I am cheering, and I'm, like, pushing him, and I'm really vocal, and I'm really into it. And I, knowing what I know now, Rosie was probably just sitting over on the bench laughing his rear end off at me, just how naive I was. You know, that I could will people to a win or that, I, you know. And, and, you know, at the end, he shook my hand and he said, Mark, you're going to do good things there. you got a lot of energy. I like you. We'll come to play you at your place. And I was like, wow. Okay. I thought he was saying my, my way I'm doing it is, is the right way. Because I swore I was never going to be that coach who carries around a cup of coffee with a flat ass and he doesn't look like he can run a wind sprint because I can't. I swore I'd never be that guy. I'm always going to be the, you know, the, the rowdy guy. And, um, you know, later on, I got a few files, letters from other coaches sent to my athletic director about my behavior on the court. And, uh, again, when we talk about most embarrassing moments, that'll, that'll come up. But uh, those teams taught me just about administration and kind of the stuff you deal with off the court that really is so much about what we do. Um, the next year, those, those international kids came in, and they taught me what winning looks like. We, we went right away. We, went, we won 20 matches. We, we kind of snuck up on some teams and some teams that had came to play us in our indoor building. We had really good results. We beat one team um, by four that I, I set it up badly for us to win. Uh, I made this other team play the number one team in the country first, and then we played them in a night match right after that. And we beat them 5-4 on our courts indoors. You know, so you can tell that um, I homered them a little bit. Their, their coach, when he shook my hand, he gave me a look and said, we'll never come back. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. And he was a pretty highly respected guy, that, and I felt very bad about it. So, Coach, um, you know, it, it's funny that you talk about the, being the young guy, being the energetic guy, the, the rowdy coach, because – I feel that in a lot of ways too, especially my first year at Salem this year, you know, I was kind of that guy. And, uh, you know, it's like you said, it's not that it's a bad thing, but I think you have to channel your own emotions to help young people channel their emotions too. And, uh, if you get too excited, then they're going to get too excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, not to name names or be specific, but <laughs> when you, when you talk about, um, getting a letter sent to the school about you, that actually did happen in our last match of the season about me. Um, and Kyle had my back and we honestly disagreed, but, uh, that did happen. And it's, it's just funny that you say that. And, you know, being the young coach, um, you know, you're already kind of maybe not disrespected, but you kind of have a chip on your shoulder. And, and for you, you know, you talk about sneaking up on teams and, and finding kind of little edges to maybe, you know, when you say homeward, it's funny because when you say that, do you mean that you you maybe downplayed the level of your team or your facility or, or what do you? Oh, no, no. I, I stacked my lineup. I made the other team play a four hour match that was more important to them than us. And I made them stay up until one in the morning to play us in a building that we don't lose in. And the, uh, and that, and then even with all that, we beat them seven, six in the third at, at, you know, a position to win the match. You know, it just wasn't a fair match for the other team. Sure, we beat a top 25 team, and had it was great for my team, but when I shook that coach's hand, that good feeling went – It didn't feel good. Went, no, I mean, I went from su – I was super excited. Oh, I was yeah. like, I thought he was going to congratulate me and tell me what a great job I did, and instead it was very disappointing. And, and I, I mean, that moment for me was an eye-opener that everybody's in this together. You know, they drove seven hours to be at my building – and to have a good weekend of tennis. And they lost 5-3 to the number one team in the country. And then they turn around and have to play us. 
and they just it just was not a fair match. They they played us in the conference championship at the end of the year outdoors and beat us very handily, like seven two. It wasn't and it wasn't even that close. The, they were, but I I didn't I put myself and my my results ahead of an even playing field, not for that coach, but for those kids. And and from that point forward, at bits and pieces, I started to realize that it's not about you and me as coaches. It's the kids' experience. I think, I think some kids are taken aback. They think I have some agenda when I run an ITA or when I have kids come to my facility and I shake all the hands of the other players and give hugs to Bluefield. I mean, I, look, man, Bluefield's our biggest rival. Charleston's our biggest rival. The culture and the, 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 the team chemistries and the camaraderie in those teams was, was bad when I got here. And quite frankly, you know, we had some, some a-holes on my team that I – Inherited. Everywhere, every team you pick up is going to have guys that don't have the same personality or vision that you have. And I've inherited some real pirate chips. But when you, when you mold that and change it, you have to start with first the guys that you know are on board. And you have to test them pretty hard and get through a season to see which guys those are. They're going to make some mistakes and they're going to, and you are too. But you, you know, Terry told me when I, Terry Derriman told me when I left WVU to head out to Nebraska, um, Terry's great. When Terry wants to tell you something really important, he always says it twice. And, and Mark, bend your knees, Ben. Bend your knees. He says it twice. If you think about that, he always does. And always. He was saying goodbye and telling me thanks for the cans and helping. You know, you'll do great, all that token stuff. But then he pulled me over and he goes, Hey, these are not your guys. These are not your kids. They're not going to listen to you and they're not going to all like you. Don't run them all off because you need them. So just get through that first year and you can see what it's about and you'll do fine. But don't, don't go in there like Attila the Hunt. I mean, if, and that, that was great advice because you, when someone tells you something serious, you know, well, oh yeah, okay, that's what I'll do. And it was really important. I've done that everywhere I've gone. We won a conference title, a regional title rather at Wesley in my first year there. We had one player that never practiced with the team the whole year because I wouldn't let him. I, I, he came to practice the second day late for the second day in a row and I told him just go you can hit with somebody else on the team whenever you want but don't come in and ruin my practices your you know your teammates he, we kicked him off the team at one point because he didn't want to go on spring break I told him his team had to vote him back on unanimously which meant that the number seven guy who was suddenly in the lineup that guy, had, that guy had to vote for him that's a tough vote man that's a tough vote and uh you know in the end that guy that guy was the deciding point why we want to reach but I had no emotional investment in that at all. That, that, that was a team decision. They can live with it. But I'm not going to have that guy come in and ruin the work that we're doing on a daily basis because that's where it gets done. It gets done in those practices. So you talk about taking your bruises and your lumps, uh, both on the court, off the court, you know, struggles, things like that. Um, thinking back on your times at Nebraska Kearney, obviously those are, those, that was your first job. And, you know, that's when you were the youngest and probably the most dumb in a lot of ways. What were some of the ways that, um, you know, you may have embarrassed yourself and, you know, things that you might have learned that maybe the hard way, rather? My first week there, there's a, there's a guy at every town that has either he's the big businessman or the big donor or he owns yeah. something. He's got, and uh, you can't always tell who those people are until you meet them. Um, have you ever heard of the buck? the brass buckle it's a store in charleston in the mall the buckle they sell like uh lucky jeans and doc martens and, and yeah of, yeah i know about it it's a nationwide chain well that's buckle. yeah yeah it started in, in carney nebraska was the original store oh. by uh, a guy named dan who uh looked like the unabomber he he had uh he had uh, overalls he played tennis and overalls alec he played tennis and overalls he come in <laughs> And when he wanted to play tennis, he would call this other guy that worked at the bank and say, hey, call the head pro. We're going to be over there at 11. So I went over one day, I was, or I was there getting stuff set up for the team, and he comes walking, knocks on the door. Hey, I want to come in and play. Dan Hirschville. His, I don't want to tell you how many millions of dollars this guy's worth, but you wouldn't know it. He, he, old ratty pickup truck, overalls, beard down to his waist. So he, uh, he wants to come in and play tennis. And I'm like, I'm sorry, we're not open. What do you think he said? 
Nothing. I'm kind of afraid of now. He didn't say anything. He said, okay, sir, uh, I'll come back some other time. Turned around, got back in the truck, drove away. About maybe 20 minutes later, the bank president who hired me shows up, and they're all out there warming up. And finally, I walk out, maybe a <laughs> half hour after they got there, I'm like, hey, where's your fourth? And they go, we're waiting on Dan. And I went, Dan? Dan who? Dan Hirschfeld, you know, the guy that owns the buckle. He has a private jet, limousines. He drives around in a pickup truck and looks like the Unabomber. So I, I made him leave. That was my first experience with the most important person in town. So I learned right away, you know, the old don't judge a book by its cover. If you're in tennis, you treat every single person with respect. You ask them, you, you're as helpful as you can be, and you go out of your way for people you don't like. Just the same way you go out of the way for people that you love, and you certainly don't do anything with people you, you don't know, because they know people, and they know people who know you. So it's just, you treat everybody the same way. You know, I've dropped a few F-bombs on the court, and I've done some things in public that I'm not proud of. And, uh, you know, I had one of my coaching friends that got fired one time because he was driving back from a Hilton Head trip. Three o'clock in the morning, he stopped at a gas station, and they opened up the door of the van, and a beer can fell out. And the, on the side of the van was the logo of the school. Pumping gas right across from him was a board member from the school. What are the odds? You know, three o'clock in the morning, that guy lost his job because of that. So you, you just got to watch everything, everywhere you go, and you got to live, the, live the, by the rule. I don't drink a beer in public. I, you know, I like beer. I'm, I'm a human being. Go to WVU, you have to like beer. Um, but I will not go out in public and have a beer or a wine because I don't want to be judged by people who don't know me that only know that I'm a coach. And if I'm going to ask my players to live with restraint, make good decisions, um, what's giving up a, a beer, you know, I can, I can have one at home when I get back, but it's, it's amazing how far that goes with my players, with their respect. They always kid, Hey, I want to coach. You're going to get a margarita or you're going to get a beer. And you know, I, ha, ha, ha. I did take a team to Hooters once though. I did. You can ask Wesley and it did happen. Was it the one in Canal City? <laughs> what's that? Was it the one in Canal City? Yes. I knew um, it. Oh. Every, you know, every team, every year. You guys are filthy. Coach, Every time we drive by, a van, a van drives by a Hooters. They all go crazy. Yep. And I always drive by and go, you guys are, you know, smoking dope. So I turned around. Hey, Charleston, we, you know, every year I had to look for a reason to motivate to play Charleston and, you know, what we could do. Uh. And I drove by. on the, we, we had just won our semifinal, and we were on our way to the Chinese buffet, which is kind of a, a tradition for us there in Kanawha City. And I saw the Hooters, and I did a U-turn, came back around, and pulled. Now, by this time, those guys don't even look at Hooters when we drive by because they know I'm not going to go there. But I pulled around and pulled into the parking lot. You would have thought it was Mardi Gras on that van. They were like, are you kidding? Are we going to? And then I pulled back out, and I went, if we win tomorrow, guys, Hooters. I think we won 8-1. It was the best match we played all year. We were unbelievable that day. Talk about team motivation. (laughs) We lost doubles, as usual. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so coach you know obviously I know you were at uh, Carney for five seasons I think and and you talked to me a little bit about this off the air but uh before we we go into your next venture um what was the importance for you of staying long enough to really have a full graduating class uh both you know to the kids but also to you as a coach and what did you prove to yourself there um that's that's a great question Alan because I think you're young. What are you now? 24, 25? I'm 24, coach. Man, you don't know anything. When you, <laughs> hey, the best years of your life, though, are coming up. 26 to 32 is the same age, but you know everything that they didn't, you just didn't know right now. And it, it, it's amazing how much work and energy you have and time to put into it. I, I told you, I called my dad on September 21st. I'll never forget that date and said, Dad, I I think I made a mistake. I, I, I think I want to come home. I mean, I, I'm really, I'd only been there six weeks. You know, my first day there, Alec, was the kickoff classic, Nebraska versus West Virginia. Ooh. They, what year they, would that have been? 1994, August 21st or something like that. We were in the Meadowlands. Um, I, I went to the, it was my first day in Kearney. I drove in and they had this big recreation center with a big screen. The whole town dresses in red. The entire state dresses in red. Oh, they yeah. all go to these places and have watch parties. They cleared out a table right in the – I walked in with my West Virginia stuff on, and I sat down at the table, 
and they cleared out like Moses in the Red Sea, bought me a pitcher of beer, popcorn, and whatever I wanted. They bought it for me, sat me right down. I was the entertainment. And they all knew who I was. It's a town of 15,000 people. They knew who I was before I walked in the door, that I was a West Virginia guy. And I think we, we lost like, what, 66 to three or something. Our Those punter, Nebraska teams in the 90s were awesome. Our punter, our punter was the most valuable player. They were, carrying, they were carrying our guys off like two or three at a time every play. I mean, Nebraska was a machine then. They only lost one game while I coached out there in four years. Yeah, Crazy. those were some of the best years in Nebraska football. Uh, Heisman winners, cha- uh, national champions. Some of the best teams of all time, uh, people think. Soak this up. The 94 team didn't have a holding call. Oh, no, it was 97, five team, 95. They didn't have a holding call all season, not one. <laughs> and they were rotating three lines in at a time in the whole game. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no, that, yeah, they had 140 guys on that team, and 90 of them were Nebraska farm boys who just wanted to wear that shirt and lift weights. And uh, uh, listen to the song by uh, Sawyer Brown about the Nebraska football program. It's it's crazy. Anyway, uh, so speaking of culture, um, what were, would you ask me about? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Sometimes I get lost too. Uh, talking about just, you know, you stayed there long enough to see oh, a full yeah. graduating class. And I think that's really important. It is. Um, my dad told me, look, you, no one's going to know what you can do until you stay somewhere four or five years, because you have to go through a cycle of, of success, failure, um, uh, front to back, fit start to finish till you know the process. You may not understand it completely, but at least you've seen it. And somebody can really judge you on program building, academics, um, the, how to structure a practice, schedule improvement, rankings will mean something. Back then, rankings meant a lot. It was a little more political than it is now. It's a lot more political, actually. But all those things, relationship building was really important. Um, I made contacts with coaches out there that I still have, that are, believe it or not, are still coaching today. And those guys are great contacts. But if I hadn't been humble and I, I, I bent over for those coaches and other teams, there were many, many, many times when our teams were treated with disrespect or were basically embarrassed or had somebody act out, out and behave badly against us. And my guys had to shut up and take it. I wouldn't let them talk. I wouldn't let them. And, and, and they knew it. They were great kids. Those guys were great kids. So, um, there was one match, one time at the end of four years. I knew I was leaving Alec, and it was our last. Remember the team that I hate. Good match, coach. You homered us. Yep. Those guys were idiots. So their head coach had just left, and he was a very emotional, fiery guy. You know, everything's good while he's beating you, but if, if yep. you beat him, he starts to be you know Jekyll and Hyde. Well, anyway, he had left. He got fired. And the new coach who came in was a super nice guy, Parks and Rec guy who had just taken over the team. But he had two All-Americans, a really, really deep team, but they did not have the same vibe. I knew they were vulnerable, and my team had gotten better. So we're at their place, and in the, uh, in the beginning of the, of the match, we put all of our hands in. And then normally, my speech is, guys, it's going to be brutal out there. Your guy's going to be an idiot. Don't take the bait. Don't talk back. And I looked at my guys that day, and I was about to shake hands. I said, fellas, you know what? For four years, you've been taking it up the rear end, and I've been telling you, take the high road, take the high road, take the high road. I love you guys. You have been wonderful for me. If their guy opens their mouth today, if they start it, you finish it. You do whatever you want to do. I trust you. The gloves are coming off. My guys looked like they got electric shock. They were just speechless. They didn't know what – they're like, are you kidding, coach? You're kidding. Right. I said, nope, today's your day. Let's kick these guys' asses. And I walked off, man. It was, it was the most energy. That, that one match alone is four hours of, of stories. Uh, crazy. I had one guy that won his match, seven, the Singapore kid. He never, ever talked. He put his hair back in a little kamikaze bun, and he would just hit a 1,000 balls. He was in incredible shape. He beat their All-American at number three for, for the match clinching point, and uh, he beat him in the second tiebreaker. My kid hadn't said a word the whole match, and the other guy was running his mouth and being crazy. The ref, you know how they all float around. The ref came yeah. over to that court during the tiebreaker. And on the changeover at 3-all, I told my guy, I said, look, the next point you win, I want you to turn around and fist pump. 
as loud as you can, come on, let's go, right at the guy. My guy never says a word. He's the typical Asian stereotype, the quiet guy. So he, he looks at me, he goes, okay, coach. He walks over, hits a winner up the line backhand, and the guy, the guy reached out to hit it, and he just happened to be looking right at my guy. And Len Carr looks right up and takes two steps forward. He goes, yeah, come on. The dude picks the ball up out of his pocket, smashes it over the fence, point penalty, we're up 6-3, just like that. And we served it out. And it was a, it, it, that was typical of the whole match. Um, our guys were so good with their emotions and controlling it that when it came time to be able to give it back a little bit, they picked the right times. So that, that, that was a master class from those guys to me on how to play those mental games and uh, when to take advantage of with other players. If somebody's loose, let them get loose and then, then stick it to them. <clears throat> Definitely, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny how sometimes in a match, it's almost like a chess match, right? And sometimes, you know, you feel like you have the ability to swing just a couple points, and that's the difference between an entire team match. And, I'm, you know, in your career, I'm sure you've been a part of several of them. Obviously, uh, you were a part of one of those with us at Fairmont. 99.9% .9 of your matches need to be and have to be very professional, treated with respect, or else those teams are not going to play you again. They, yes. Their coaches have the power not to schedule you. Uh, they certainly have the, the, the wherewithal not to come play you at your place. If your crowd's bad or your facility is not up to par. You just don't, you don't have a referee, those kind of things. But there's that one-tenth of one percent, Alex, where, <laughs> where it's a WWF, you know, cage match. And, you know, I, I, Terry likes to talk about this one match with Ohio State at Fred Wyatt Racquet Club. I love that story. And love I, it. I was there. And you were there? I thought, I thought Terry's head was going to explode. You know, and like you can't really tell what's going on because the courts you couldn't see any. The courts were very bad viewing and they were kind of laid out in a weird way. But when I walk up and I saw Terry just turn around, throw his hat down, and he's yelling. I can't remember if he was yelling at Gary Fry or if he was yelling at the ref or I mean, I just, it's fuzzy. But I just remember that image of him like his face got real red and he couldn't talk and he was, you know, just pumping it. Like, he got the guys together and said, look, I, I, you know, I don't care if we win or lose. We're gonna, if we got to fight, we'll fight. You know? <laughs> you know, it was, it was uh, kind of cool to watch. But, you know, hell, I'm in a tennis match. Shh, you know, not this match. It was pretty crazy. You know, allegedly, Ty Tucker spit across the net at Gary Fry. Yep, I heard about that part, too. It's actually one of my favorite Terry stories. I mean, you talked yeah. about the crowd being crazy. I think there was a fraternity there that was being obnoxious. Yeah. And um, mind, you, mind you, Ty Tucker coaches the number one team in the country. Yeah, yeah, he coaches he, at Ohio State. legend right now and uh, truly one of the best recruiters and team builders there is. So, you know, there's, there, it's in you and every guy to channel that angst and, and make it a positive thing. You know, do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. But, but, um, amazing back then. Uh, some of the players and teams that Terry brought into Morgantown and got to watch them. Um, you got, how, where are we at on time? We still got some time? Uh, yeah, we're about – Man, 45 minutes in. Uh, I'd, I'd like to go for about 15 more minutes on this one. You're never going to get me to shut up. Matt Santon called me one time for advice. I about dropped dead. I thought Matt must be really at the end of his rope if he's calling me. Um, that or just once he's got to bet on how long I can talk. Uh, one match that I'll never forget that I learned so much about, um, Terry had the University of Florida in uh, to play. Again, Mark Boris was number one at the time. WVU and back then the Coliseum courts were up top right behind where the uh, basketball practice facility is yeah you had uh, Terry would bring bleachers in and and showcase you know a couple courts at a time so there was seating and viewing was great um it was a good weather day uh, it was just a great atmosphere the team was good Mark Morris was maybe third or fourth year so he was getting close to being All-American and had his game down with certain volley and big serve but he played Mark Merklin who was a freshman number one in the country Mark Merklin played professional tennis, great guy. Um, Mark uh, Boris hit 22 out of 24 aces, and the other two shots were service winners. He, it, it got to the point where Boris was smiling a little bit because he knew what kind of show he was putting on. He was, let me think about it, 22 aces. He lost the set. In a tiebreaker. Merklin just walked back and forth. Never broke his expression, sat 
down on the bench. I mean, I was all about Boris. I was like, can you believe this guy's doing this? Can you believe it? And I'm looking at this little scrawny kid. He looked, and Boris looked like a you know, skyscraper next to him. And then Merkin would go over and he'd just scrap around and he'd hold serve. They got to a tiebreaker, Boris double faulted once in 7 6. It's crazy how, how small, you like, like I said before, one point literally changes everything. So, I mean, you talk about mental toughness. Uh, Absolutely. It, it seems like Merklin in that match, he, he was extremely mentally tough because, I mean, you've played a lot of matches as a player in your day. And I think uh, myself personally, if I'm in a match where I'm getting aced that often, again, I've never been aced 22 times in a single set. Dude, nobody has. I, I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't, I've never I don't seen know anybody. how I would take it mentally. I mean, just to get aced, you know, once or twice every game, it, it can really deteriorate your mental, you know, ability because, you know, you're getting frustrated. You're not even putting a racket on it. So, then, you know, to be that once, tough. Once, once that set was over, Merklin, I think it was might have been over one second set. It was just a – how do you hang in there when the storm's like that? I want to I want to double set one time with a, a guy that played college tennis, a good player. I don't know why he's playing with me. He was a tournament somewhere. And he was super nice, and I was kind of embarrassed to be playing with him because he was so good. But he was great to me all the way through it. I didn't get one single return in in the entire first set, and we won because they double faulted to me in a tiebreaker. I didn't get one. I'm not, I'm not even like I couldn't. I barely got racket on the ball to get it over the net. Not one return did I get in play. You know, and how many times can you say I'm sorry to your partner? And you know, the guy just kept coming over and smiling and patting me on the back and going, "Hey, man, that was pretty bad. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll be fine." And, you know, he, he knew that the other guys were going to choke later because of him. They knew that they were whacked out about him. But he treated me great. And those are things that I take with me when I look at doubles teams. You know, my doubles team notoriously stay together for all four years. You know, if, if there's a chemistry there at the beginning, you might have some tough times. But if it's a good, good mix of skill, um, chemistry is important. But I used to think skill and matching those guys up was more important. I think at our level now, it's just competing. The guys that love to compete. Um, at, at ne at Nebraska Kearney, my best doubles team there of all time, they, they won over 50 matches with only maybe 10 losses. Um, the kid that played number one um, played with a kid that wasn't even in the lineup for a while. And he, he was playing number two with the number one guy. And he came to me after a few losses and said, hey, coach, I want to try something tomorrow. We we're playing the University of Denver. Rob Ortel, a good friend of mine. Um, we were playing them, and he asked me, Coach, let's, uh, let, uh, let us pick the doubles teams tomorrow. It's a D1 team. Don't worry about it. We have nothing to lose. I'm like, okay, sure, whatever you want to do. Who do you want to play with? And he goes, I want to play with Johannes. And I'm like, dude, Johannes isn't even in the lineup. He has no backhand. He has no backhand. He, he's, his serve is flat. He, I mean, he can't, he's a coach. Johannes loves to compete, man. He loves it. He's a terrorist out there. Let me play with him. I'm like, all right, man. You can take, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, we'll stack number one doubles with you and Johannes and, you know, try to win two and three. They didn't lose. They won 20-some straight matches. They didn't lose until conference championship. And that was my team, again, showing me what's, how, to, how to coach. Yeah. Sometimes the guys know better than you. So, Coach, uh, you know, we're, we're not getting – we're running a little bit further on time than I'd like, but it's okay because this is super entertaining for me, and I can't wait for people to listen to it. Um, I don't want to go Barton, back and clean my courts either, so this is this is good for me. First of all, I haven't said on the air yet. Amazing background. Uh, you win. You you're number one so far in the background department. Uh, Coach John Parker uh, had a, a really cool virtual background of his daughter hitting what he called a perfect volley, and uh, we actually discussed the form of it to start, which was really fun. But uh, you've got the best real background I've seen so far, and I'm really jealous. Well, listen, um, this, this was a once in a lifetime opportunity for a division two coach like me. Um, you know, my, my, my career has kind of gone full circle. Um, I've been humbled many times along the way. And um, if I had to do it all over again, there are some people that are D one guys and there are some guys that are D two, D three guys. And I'm just not cutthroat enough. I'm not, uh, I just don't, I don't think I'm a hard enough worker really to be, uh, a legit D1 guy. And more importantly, um, I don't have the balls to just cut people because of business and say, hey, you're not working out, you know, take, you, you, give me your scholarship back. My, my system of recruiting and how I scholarship is, has been the same since the very first year in Nebraska. And it came out of necessity, but I learned, you know, kind of uh, retro that 
the way I did it motivates players and gives everybody a feeling of satisfaction and, and being rewarded. So those things are what retain players. If everybody's treated completely fairly, I mean, and that was just me out of, I was so fair in my system because I was afraid to try to make that decision. You're worth more than him. She's worth more than her. I just treat everybody the same. I want an entire team of number four players. I don't want, I mean, if you look at the Vitor Albanese's of our, our region, Baptiste. Uh, Jake Carey. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're not going to have a player of the year very often unless I can, excuse me, unless I can manipulate it a little bit and, and things fall exactly perfect. You lose to him, he loses to him, and then he beats him. Um, and that's what happened with Mike. And, you know, Mike went in that thing um, his freshman year at Wesleyan. Um, but we're going to be really solid at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, because those are the spots where the guys are developing and I need that depth to get through injuries and, you know, girlfriend breakup issues or saying whatever, all the things that can hinder a team. Um, you just have to be prepared for that. And I think in the end, I don't care if I beat you four, three or seven, zero at four, three means I get to go home with a trophy. That's what I'm going to start off the season. And, and also if your team is used to playing four, three matches all the time, your guys at four, five, and six know they have to win. We're counting on them. That's the mentality they have every time they get out of the van, and you don't have to coach that into them. They just know, hey, we're playing tennis today. Three hours, pack a lunch, let's make somebody miserable. So, Coach, uh, one last thing before we end part one here, uh, and, and this is a little bit more off topic, but I think you're going to enjoy it. Tell me your best Brandon Simmons story that you could tell in a five-minute span. Ooh. Ooh, Shout out Brandon ooh. Simmons, one of my best friends in the world. Taught me more about tennis than probably anyone in the world. Part Doubles up. partner, love promise that guy. Me, promise me in part two we'll talk, talk about his team a little bit. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, also about his family because um, the great, great tennis influence in Elkins and just, you know, back in the old days of the uh, Grand Prix circuit, Dave Simmons was my first guy that ever fed a tennis ball to me. Love um, Dave Simmons. Yeah. Love Brandon Simmons. Great Brandon, family. Brandon Simmons and Brent Ching made it to the Southeast Regional Doubles Finals in, in Brandon's junior year. Um, they were they played number one doubles the year before. They were about a 500 record, maybe. Tough region. I mean, you got yeah. Armstrong, Atlantic, all the Peach Belt teams. Uh, we had uh, one year our team in, in, uh, in 2007, my Barton team was 18th in the country in March. And finished, we finished 21. We were 18 in the country, and we missed the regional by three spots. We weren't even close. We, we beat four other number one seeds from other, from other regions. Um, it, it was just, that's just the way the tennis was. And it was legit, legit too. I mean, it was legit we were out. Those teams were better than us. So, um, you know, we, those guys go down there and, you know, they didn't get seeded, of course, because they, even though they had played together two years, they were kind of seeded. Brandon, it wasn't in our singles lineup. So it, it looked like a stack on paper. But if you've ever seen Brandon play doubles, you, you just know that he's explosive. And, you know, Brandon can do anything for three shots, man. Three shots is his game. So uh, he, uh, he paired up with a guy, Brent Ching, who is a very athletic guy, has a very steady, compact game, short, very Joby Foley-ish in the way he hits the ball and plays the plays inside the court. So uh, those two guys together, really good doubles team. Well, they got to the uh, – two days before we were supposed to leave for the ITA, Brandon's girlfriend breaks up with him. And he calls me – I don't know, God, it was late – and says, Coach, I'm not going to the ITA. I'm like, Brandon, man, you – you have to go. I mean, we only take four guys. Your, your doubles partner is already – we already made the draws. You got to go. And he's like, I can't, man. I got to drive to West Virginia and see my girlfriend. I'm like, Brandon, you can't. Give me 10 minutes, I'll be there. I was on his porch from midnight until 4 in the morning just talking and getting him loosened out. And, you know, but his brain was la-la land. We get down to the ITA, and that format back then you had to win seven matches. It was a – 64 draw the doubles big so the first day they played armstrong atlantic's number three doubles team which was ended up being ranked in the top 50 um they beat them nine eight first round brandon played well the other team just didn't really take us seriously got themselves behind the eight ball and we ended up winning the next round they beat augusta state eight one they beat a seeded francis marion team the next morning 
uh, pretty hard. The next round, they beat Georgia College and State. Next thing I know, they're in the quarterfinals. Um, they turned around and beat Armstrong's number two team in the quarterfinals. This was at Armstrong. The run was amazing. Now, the night match against Francis Marion, that was a seeded team. Uh, Simon Earnshaw from, from uh, Armstrong walked up and he goes, you know, Mark, everybody's pretty sure you've been stacking your number one doubles all the time, but I've got to say that American chap can play a bit. It's a good team. And then he walked away. Didn't come back, didn't walk much anymore. Uh, Brandon was jumping 20 feet in the air, smacking overheads from the baseline. It, yep. dude, the, when the ball got above the lights, you couldn't see it. Nobody could see that ball on the court but Brandon. You just hear this loud crap, and, and, and two guys would look around like, where'd the ball go? It was a winner. Um, he was lights out for three days in a row. Just the way his brain was with so many marbles bouncing around all the time, that's Brandon by nature. You, you, you can't really get those guys to focus very well, and I think that was one of the problems with his with singles was too many players just grind at our level. I mean, we were a 10,000 ball team. Every yep. team I've ever had has been built that way. But um, he had, he just cleared his head out. He got to the tournament. It was camaraderie with his teammates. It was get away from my life for four days, no studying, no girlfriend. And he just, just played tennis. And it was the most amazing display. We ended up losing 8-5 on in the finals. But that morning, Brandon, we, it's dead silent in the van. We went, our eight guys are, are driving to the courts. Um, they had a full B draw down there. They had a uh, 128 B draw out there. It was a huge region, and brutal. So uh, we pull in, and there's three vans there. Ours, Georgia College and State, and the Armstrong, Armstrong coach. That's it. There's nobody there. And Brandon's like, Coach, where is everybody? Did they cancel the tournament? And I'm like, no, Brandon, that's what Sunday looks like. There's nobody else but you. You, you, and that's, you're going to see people today that weren't here all weekend because they don't even bother. Armstrong, half the time, Armstrong's coach doesn't even come to the NCAA regionals first round. He's, he's off recruiting, you know, ITFs or, you know, some kind of challenger. He didn't, you know, sends his assistant coach to beat me 7-0. So, uh, interesting. But Brandon, for one shining moment, you know, you look at it, he was in that zone where uh, he was as good as anybody that plays at our level. Amazing story, Coach. I've heard that one, you know, from Brandon's perspective and a couple other people, but I really wanted to hear it from you, and I kind of figured you'd go that way. Did, um, did they win in Brandon's version? Did they win the championship? No, they didn't. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, but he, he did talk about, you know, just how he kind of caught fire and, you know, how him, the chemistry him and his doubles partner had. And you know, like you said, Brandon, man, he's one of the most explosive players I've seen. He's, you know, he's like 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, I know he was pretty muscle bound at that point too. He had a big vertical, and, and when he hit, when Brandon hits an overhead, even like in his current state, when he hits an overhead, he he will hurt you. He, he and he is not afraid to hurt you either. Uh, and comes, I've been on the other end of that. Moves. Yeah, yeah. When he's when he's looking at you about to smash an overhead, because I've been on that end, he will hit it right at your face. And that's what I love about Brandon, and that's why I love playing with him because people were so intimidated by him. You know, just and he screams, man. One, one, one tidbit about that moment when Brandon said that was, you know, Alec, that was the first day I'd ever been there on Sunday. So inside, I was thinking the exact same thing that he was. But as the leader and the coach, you don't want to turn around and go, holy crap, guys, what the hell is going on? You know, you, I, just, I just realized that what I thought the tennis experience was at that level that I was at, there's a whole nother level above that that those guys just take for granted. Oh, hell, I ran the ITA in, in Barton for many years. There were several years where Lise McRae had three or all four semifinalists. And that sounds a, like Bluefield uh, State. That's a tough regional, and they had everybody. They were a solid top 15 team. Um, you just see programs like that, and you hope to aspire. You need a Bluefield in every region to, to set the bar for where people have to achieve to. Otherwise, you never know what the marker is. And uh, I've been very lucky and fortunate to every program I've been to has made those leaps and bounds. Athletic directors have stayed in place. Budgets have stayed the same. Donors have been nice to me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a cheap ass. You, know, you ask anybody how I spend money and what we do. There's no glamour in it whatsoever. But you play the teams you need to play. You roll the dice on those days, uh, those long trips, because no one's coming to West Virginia to play us. You know, there's no one flying into Morgantown to play, you know, Wesleyan. So you're going to play everybody on their home facilities after driving half a day or a full day. 
jump out of the van and you got to be able to ball. And uh, once you get the guys' mentalities right and the girls, they, they can get out there and they can play. They know they can do it. So uh, you prepare as best you can, but that's the lesson that you learn about that next level. They're not making excuses at that level. There's nobody saying, well, if we'd, have, if we'd have stayed overnight or, you know, if we'd have ate, uh, you know, breakfast over there, or, you know, if we had these, if these courts to practice on, we would be there. Wesleyan didn't have outdoor courts for, for three years while I was there, and our guys rolled out over 70 matches away consecutively. And we were a championship-level team. No excuses, nobody dropping their head, woe is us, we don't have courts. We had one indoor court to practice on in a gym balcony, and that's what we built a national-level program because the glass is half full. And if your guys have that chip on their shoulder and they love it, not only that, man, every facility we went to was the Taj Mahal. We would go to Kanawha City, wow, these courts are great. We'd go to, you know, DC, wow, it's amazing. You know, get out of Buchanan and go see, we, we really loved every facility that we went to. It's sad, I got here, the, my kids on my team, we're not, very, we're not very solid. We have a lot of work to do. We're not ranked, uh, we're in a tough region. They take these courts for granted. They walk in here. Sometimes they don't wipe their feet off. Sometimes they, they I'm like, what are you doing? You guys have to worship this place. This is, this is unbelievable and you have to appreciate it. And uh, you, know, you want people to have that kind of respect for the whole program, not just facilities, but for each other and the coaches. Amazing words uh, to end part one on coach. Uh, thank you. And uh, obviously, hopefully everyone that's listened to this, uh, you know, whenever they get to uh, is excited for part two and, uh, We'll be right back. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys.